Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, Remote Calls Are Not Equal to Local Calls. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about graceful degradation when services fail. My name is Dan Reedy, uh, and I am a senior software engineer at AppNeta, where we make uh, network and application performance monitoring tools. And uh, you can contact me on Twitter, GitHub, and uh, Gmail if you have any comments or feedback. All right. so. Uh, Today, we're living in a world where our systems of the past are becoming more distributed than ever due to the growing trends to decouple these systems into smaller services. And with this architecture evolution, we're introducing dependencies throughout our system. We depend on the network and the services to be reliable and available so that, when the, so that the system as a whole can operate in a healthy manner because a healthy system will hopefully equal happy users and hopefully happy users results in a profit. But you know, as we increase the number of dependencies within our system, we're also potentially increasing our points of failure. It's inevitable that the networks and the services will fail, and so we need to think critically when making remote calls throughout our system. So being armed with this knowledge, we know we can't treat a remote call like a local call. There's just too much that can go wrong when we have to go out to the network. And I think we need to give some extra consideration to these remote calls. So kind of all that being said, this is kind of the question I want to explore in this talk. What approaches support graceful degradation when the dependencies in my system, my services, my networks, my data stores, fail? And so this is kind of my personal hit list when I like to think about this problem. Now, please note, that this list is not exhaustive in any way, but it's simply a list of approaches that I like to think as good starting points. And for the purpose of this talk, uh, we're going to basically focus on timeouts, the circuit breaker pattern, and retries, because I feel like these approaches you know, fit the characteristics that uh, I'm personally looking for. And we'll talk about all three of these in some more details in the upcoming slides. But also, as a warning, it's not one size fits all. Uh, so anytime you pick an approach, you know, make sure that you explore how it fits into your problem domain uh, that you're attempting to solve. So that being said, uh, I encourage you to explore these other topics if you find them interesting. All right. So let's assume that we are all working on a system that has the following infrastructure. We have a simple web app that talks to two different services. Uh, both these services are RESTful, and the web app talks to these services over HTTP. And both these services give very simple JSON responses. The time service gives us some time, and the user service gives us the user's name. All right. So now, from a user's perspective, we have this great looking web application <laughs> uh, where we display the user's name and uh, the current time. And with these three terminals, we're running the web app here. We're running the time service here, which is giving us our time. And then finally, we're running our user service, which is supplying the user uh, name to the uh, web application. Some very high tech stuff. OK, so with that system in our minds, you know, how should we degrade if the time service is actually unavailable? And you know, we want to approach our stakeholders and determine you know, what do we actually show the user when it actually fails? And so from a presentation point of view, and in this example, we really just want to display unavailable to our user. And this approach demonstrates one of the main concepts behind graceful degradation, where you can either decrease the amount of work or time needed by decreasing the quality of your response. And from a quality point of view, you know, we can determine that unavailable is good enough. And obviously, you can get creative with the presentation aspect of failure. But again, for this example, let's just keep it simple and show unavailable to the user. Uh, secondly, uh, we also want to give up after three uh, seconds on our requests. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, this in some more uh, detail later in the talk, but let's assume that that decision is backed by data. And then finally, we want to prevent the problems with this service uh, from cascading into the web application. High latency should remain isolated in the time service and not cascade into the web application if we can help it. All right, so let's jump into timeouts. I feel like uh, Michael Nygaard really nails it here with their quote on timeouts. We can't wait forever. You eventually need to give up on a response. Hope is not a design method. <laughs> now, I personally buy into this. So when it comes out to going, you know, sending a request out into the network, I like to time out all the things. 
You just, you can't guarantee your response times. So I personally think of timeouts as my last ditch option in case something, uh, latency becomes a problem uh, downstream. And timeouts are pretty easy to get started with. For most language and libraries, it's as simple as adding an optional parameter to your request. Here we're using Python's request library, which I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with. And I'm able to tell requests to simply give up after three seconds. And expanding on this example, uh, you can see that by adding a simple exception handling, um, to, I can add ex uh, simple exception handling to gracefully degrade our response to unavailable when we encounter a timeout. So now, obviously, this is a Python-specific example, but I encourage you to check out your language and library documentation to see how timeouts are supported. OK, so back to our uh, example system. So let's assume that the time service is in some unhealthy state, uh, and let's say it's due to high latency. And we have this timeout that we just looked at configured to three seconds from all our requests going from the web app to the time service. So from the user's perspective, we're gracefully degraded the app web application into a partially failing state. We're able to deliver the user information, but not the time information. So thus, we just show them our unavailable, which we determine is good enough. Um, but in addition, uh, no matter how high the latency is on the time service, let's say it's going to take 10 seconds to respond, um, we're simply cutting it off at three seconds. And the user is definitely able to feel that through page load time, which you can see pointed out. And then finally, uh, we're able to observe in the timeout. Uh, we're able to observe the timeout in the time service because uh, there's the broken pipe exception that's being thrown since the client has closed the network socket before the server can respond. Okay, so if we take this example into consideration, timeouts aren't perfect. You know, they're easy to get started with. They provide some fault isolation, but our response is still bound to the timeout value. You set your timeouts too high, you're going to be waiting 10 seconds. Uh, if you set your response uh, timeouts too low, you might actually never complete the request. And additionally, we're also uh, applying load to these unhealthy services um, every single time a request is coming through. So I feel like timeouts take you one step in the right direction, but we need just a little bit more. So let's look at how we can improve timeouts by combining them with the circuit breaker pattern. So the goal of the circuit breaker pattern is to allow a single subsystem to fail without destroying the entire system. In the electrical world, when an electrical circuit fails, and let's say due to a short circuit, uh, we don't burn the entire house down to the ground. And I think we can all agree that's a good thing. Uh, so the interesting thing to point out is that a circuit breaker prevents operations rather than re-executing them. So it's very different than a retry. Uh, and this is kind of an important thing to keep in mind on the slides uh, ahead. And so finally, uh, this pattern is a great example of the software world embracing a lesson learned from another industry. Software industry learning from other industries. That sounds a little familiar. All right. Um, I'd also like to point out the circuit breaker pattern has some street cred. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. It was introduced by Nygaard back in 2007, heavily embraced by the folks at Netflix, and even Martin Fowler is a fan. So I encourage you to check out these resources for more use cases and examples. All right, so this is a state uh, diagram of uh, the circuit breaker pattern. And I know there's a lot going on here, and I don't expect everyone to read all the transitions and whatnot. Um, so just bear with me, because I'm going to break this down in some of the upcoming slides. The important piece of information that I kind of want everyone to understand is what the three states mean. And so the closed state is when all requests are allowed to pass through. So if you think of a drawbridge, when it's closed, all my traffic can go through. And when we're in the open state, all requests are prevented from passing through. So again, if the drawbridge is open, traffic can't get through. And then finally, uh, half open is kind of the special state where we allow a single request to pass through for exploratory purposes to determine whether the downstream service is healthy or not. As for Python support, uh, here's an example that uses the PyBreaker library to instantiate a single circuit breaker for the time service. Now, most circuit breaker implementations take the following parameters, uh, fail max and reset timeout. Fail max is basically how many times will I accept failure before I decide to throw open that circuit breaker and prevent operations. And my uh, reset timeout is essentially, while the circuit breaker is in, is in that open state, 
how long should we wait before we actually send out that exploratory request to check on the service's health? And we can conveniently apply the circuit breaker instance to our previously defined uh, get time function simply as a decorator. And you uh, single uh, signal uh, failures to the circuit breaker by simply raising a circuit breaker error. All right. So back to our uh, example system. Let's assume it's in a healthy state. Let's assume that requests are coming into the web application. Both our services are responding in uh, f around 50 milliseconds, and the circuit breaker is in a closed state. So life is good. As more requests come into the web app, we can see the latency on the time service is starting to increase. It continues to increase until eventually we actually encounter a timeout. And so when this happens, the circuit breaker notes the failure and increments its failure count to one. As more requests come into the system, it increments its failure count to two. And then finally, since we picked three as our max fail, it says, OK, well, I'm now going to transition from closed to open. And thus, um, we can now say, hey, the time service is in an unhealthy state. And this is from the web app's perspective. And so with the circuit breaker open, we're now going to prevent requests from going from the web app to the time service. And so as more requests come into the system, we're simply saying, nope, not going to talk to the time service. I get my information from the user service and just uh, keep handling requests. So from a user's perspective, we've once again gracefully degraded the web application into its partial, partially failing state. And the user gets the same experience as a timeout in the sense that we get the user's information but not the time. Uh, but we get that in a fraction of the time because we're no longer bound to the timeout value. And the interesting thing to kind of point out here is that we're also reducing load on the time service while the circuit breaker remains in its open state, which is a nice bonus in this situation. And so requests keep coming in. We keep preventing them. But eventually, our reset timeout will trigger. And if you remember, we set that to 30 seconds. And so the circuit breaker will transition to that half open state. And when the next request comes in, it will actually allow it to go through, again, for exploratory purposes, to figure out, hey, is, is this time, has this time service recovered or not? Well, it hasn't. And so it says, well, all right, back to open it goes, and continues to prevent um, requests. So as you can imagine, you could sit in this loop for a while. Essentially, every 30 seconds, you send out that exploratory request, and it's going to continue to time out. And the circuit breaker will remain open and continue to prevent uh, requests from going through. But hopefully, someone from your ops team will come in and save the day and return the service to a healthy state, whatever the problem may be. And so after that event happens, when the reset timeout triggers once again, we allow the next request to come through. It will succeed, and the, the circuit breaker says, well, my job here is done, transitions to close, and starts allowing requests to come through. So from the user's perspective, we've recovered gracefully, and we're disp now displaying both pieces of information once again to the user, and we're doing it in a timely manner. So victory is ours. Now, I personally feel that timeouts and circuit breakers complement each other very nicely. We get our desired graceful degradation. We can fail fast, but we can also rapidly recover. We're able to reduce load on the unhealthy services, as well as avoid an unhealthy service from cascading its problems throughout the system. And finally, as a bonus, we can think of our circuit breakers as this interface to monitor and measure all the different points of integration within our system. And I'll talk about that last uh, uh, bullet uh, in, in more detail in an upcoming slide. But I also want to point out that the, this pattern isn't perfect. And if you apply it with the incorrect parameters to an under-provisioned service, you can experience flapping. And this is basically where the circuit breaker is constantly flapping between an open and closed state because the selected parameters don't match the service's performance constraints. So if you set too aggressive of a timeout value or so forth, you could see the circuit breaker uh, flapping back and forth. So again, just something to consider you know, if you decide that you want to adopt this pattern. And as far as the parameters go, uh, these are kind of the questions you need to ask yourselves and your stakeholders, you know, should you decide to adopt this pattern? You know, what do I want to present during failure? Uh, is it as simple as just showing unavailable, or is it something more complicated? Um, you know, how many times do you actually accept failure, which is your uh, max fails value? Uh, how long will I actually wait until I attempt reset? Uh, 
Is 30 seconds too aggressive? Is it uh, too lax? And then finally, uh, how long will you actually wait before you give up on a request? Now, finding the right values to uh, all these parameters can take some exploration, but it definitely helps if you're monitoring your system's performance and you actually have some data to drive your decisions. So here, we're looking at a heat map of my company's production web servers making requests to one of our user management services over a seven-day uh, time period. Each of those blue squares basically represents a grouping of requests based on their latency and uh, where they occurred during that seven-day period. So thus, the darker the blue, the more requests that you have occurred in that bucket. So I'm able to basically look at this uh, visualization, and I'm sorry for the people in the back, you can't probably read the smaller numbers, but the, uh, the majority of my requests are going to fall under the two-second watermark. I have a single outlier that's uh, above six seconds. My average uh, request latency for this service is roughly uh, 70 milliseconds. And then uh, during the busy periods of the day, which looks to be the early afternoons, uh, I can see latency increase to roughly one second consistently during business days. So I'm able to understand my peak performance, my average performance, and my outliers all from this one visualization. So if I were to take this all into consideration, I could intelligently pick a timeout value of around two seconds because I know that's going to give me enough headroom to work with so that my uh, timeouts aren't you know, constantly triggering a circuit breaker and uh, causing it to flap. So um, as a side note, I highly recommend you look into performance monitoring if you're not using it already. So like I mentioned before, uh, this pattern is very well established, so the library support is real. Um, just want to call out to the Java folks, if there are actually any in the crowd, um, that Netflix's uh, Hystrix library is more than just a circuit breaker, but a full-featured fault tolerance library that you should definitely check out. And one of the cool things with the Hystrix library is that it comes with a complete circuit breaker monitoring dashboard. So this is a screenshot of Netflix monitoring integration points within their system using circuit breakers. Each of those sections basically represents a single circuit breaker in its current state. And I know there's a lot of information going on this slide, and it'd take like 30 minutes just to describe it. But if you want some more uh, details on it, uh, you, know, you can check out the, the link at the bottom. Um, but nonetheless, it's a nice freebie that you get with the library. OK. So let's uh, talk about retries next. Now, I think retries are pretty self-explanatory. If at first something doesn't succeed, let's attempt the operation again. So that being said, let's focus more on when should a retry be used. And I feel to answer that question, you need to ask yourself another question. Does the benefit of obtaining a response from a service outweigh potentially increasing load on that service? The reality of a retry is that one request can have a multiplicative effect on a system. If I, if I decide to retry four times, my one request has the potential to become five requests. And as you can imagine, that can get out of control really quickly if a system has insufficient capacity and can't keep up. So depending on your problem domain, you know, this might actually not be an easy question to answer. But I just kind of want to emphasize that this is something you should always be thinking about um, and, uh, you know, uh, before you actually want to use a, a retry. So, Assuming that you've accepted that trade-off, let's next talk about some considerations when you're actually using a retry. To begin with, never retry a request indefinitely. Always limit the number of retries per request. Secondly, in, uh, including a time delay between retry attempts uh, will help reduce contention on a service. The classic approach is using an exponential backoff, where you are exponentially increasing the time delay between attempts in order to gradually decrease, decrease load on a service. Another technique that I just recently uh, discovered from the Amazon folks is adding randomized jitter to your delay um, time between retry attempts. Now, this may sound counterintuitive, but adding that randomized jitter helps distribute retries over the retry window. So in the scenario that you experience a brief network outage, that randomized jitter can actually help reduce contention by slightly offsetting and spreading out your uh, retry requests once the network becomes available again. And so uh, let's see what retrying looks like in Python. So as you ex expect, there are several libraries for retrying in Python. In this example here, I'm using the retrying library, a uh, personal favorite. Uh, 
And the retrying library provides an extremely configurable retry director, der, uh, decorator. <laughs> and uh, you can see that we're setting the three parameters I was just mentioning. I set my max number of retry attempts to three. I set my exponential back off multiplier to one second. Uh, and you can see how uh, the weight delay is calculated in the comment where n is the current retry count. I set the max random jitter to half a second. So basically every retry attempt will add that random, uh, a random uh, jitter value from zero to 500 milliseconds to the actual weight delay. And then finally, we can signal uh, failed attempts uh, to the uh, retry director by simply raising some exception. So that all being said, let's now apply this uh, example uh, in the context of our system. Uh, let's assume the uh, network uh, connection from the web app to the user service is experiencing a brief network outage. So when a request comes into our web app, our first attempt to actually get the response will fail. However, since we have that retry uh, configured, um, we will exponentially uh, back off between our attempts, and so now we'll just simply wait to make our second attempt. So while we're waiting, let's assume that the network has recovered and returns to a healthy state. We finish waiting, we make our second attempt to the user servers, it succeeds, and returns the requested information to the user after a slight delay. So again, you know, pretty uh, straightforward stuff, um, and this is really kind of a perfect world uh, uh, scenario of retries. So let's look quickly at what uh, happens when retries go terribly wrong. So this example is called the combinational retry explosion. And I got it from the, uh, the new site reliability engineering book, uh, which was written by several Googlers. I highly recommend you check it out. And the problem results from issuing retries at multiple levels within your system without using any retry strategy, uh, which I'll talk about after this example. So in the following stack, let's assume that the database uh, layer can't service requests because it's overloaded and is in, un in an unhealthy state. So let's observe what will happen when the three layer layers above it, JavaScript, front end, and back end, um, are all using retries configured to make four attempts no matter what happens. So if the user you know, performs some type of interaction, each layer makes its uh, first attempt. But when we get to the back end layer, it makes its first attempt and fails. So OK, number two, that fails. Number three, up, oh, I failed again. Four. All right, well, that's my max uh, retries, so now let's bubble the error up one level. So now from the front end's perspective, it says, well, my first attempt failed, let's make a second. <laughs> and so the back end, uh, you know, not knowing any better, makes one attempt fails, two, three, four, they all fail, and it bubbles it up a level. Again, the front end says, well, my second attempt failed, let's make a third attempt. And so I think you get the idea of where I'm kind of going with this. Since we're making four attempts across three different levels, we end up making 64 attempts from a single user interaction. So yeah, that's like the worst case scenario. And, but I think it demonstrates how one, can use, uh, how one can use retries very irresponsibly. And I also think it's just good to be aware of this problem in general. So that being said, let's jump into some strategies that one can leverage with retries. So, First and foremost, always use clear response codes. Consider how different failure modes should be handled on both the client and the server side. For example, if you know uh, that an error is not retriable, let the client know so it doesn't even bother retrying. Additionally, return a specific status when a service is overloaded so that the clients and the other layers above it simply back off and do not attempt retries. Secondly, there are several ways that you can enforce budgets on your retry. If you want to do per request, you can basically say, how, how many times do I let a single request retry? There's also per client, where you say, you know, how many times do I let a single client retry? And you can also consider having a server-wide retry budget. You know, for example, limiting a process to handling only, let's say, 60 retries per minute. If the budget is exceeded, you simply don't retry. You just fail the request. Uh, if the service is under provisioned, you know, that can make the difference between a few drop queries and a cascading failure. And in an emergency, you know, if, uh, it might not be obvious that an outage is due to bad retry behavior. So obviously monitoring and graphing uh, your retry counts can uh, help quickly diagnose if retries are getting out of control.
And so uh, wrapping up retries, uh, they can be very effective when applied responsibly. However, they can be harmful when applied irresponsibly. So just be smart. The easiest way to mitigate harmful retries is to adopt a retry strategy that is consistently applied across your system. And so just to make sure that I give credit where credit is due, both these books are amazing resources that I leaned on heavily for this talk. So check them out if you find this material interesting. And uh, thank you, PyCon, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dan. We have a couple of more minutes for Q&A. So if you have a question, please step forward to the microphone. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. I'm curious if you have any amendments or suggestions for distributed systems. You know, for example, your time service has an array of a dozen instances, sure. and one's flapping, or half of them are flapping, et cetera. Sure. Um, so uh, in that case, uh, you could think about it from, so I like to think about it from the client's perspective in the sense of, you know, I have a circuit breaker that's talking to the service. And so in that case, you're going to start noticing that your, you know, failure is going to go up, but it's not going to be across the entire cluster, right? So it's going to be like a fraction at that point. And so you would really want to have monitoring on your host as well that would be able to, uh, you know, to uh, signal that that type of problem is happening with that one instance. Uh, one of the other patterns that I, I didn't talk about in this talk, but the bulkhead uh, pattern somewhat addresses that in a sense, um, but not all the way. So really, that's just uh, monitoring on your actual in uh, individual instances. And in the case, if this was like an auto-scaling group, you obviously want to rip that instance out and then let a new, a fresh one come back up if it's limited there. So yeah, yep. Um. I wanted to ask you, uh, when it's half open, when you said in the, in the break that it's half open, um, you have like three seconds timeout until you decide if it's closed or open again. Sure. What happens with all the other requests that are arriving in that moment? Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously that was a really simplified, you know, one request coming in a second. But uh, if you, you know, that counter is going to keep incrementing, you know, any time a request comes in and it times out. So, you know, uh, each, each circuit breaker is going to be actually local to the process that's actually handling it. So let's say you actually have, like, you know, on a single host, you know, eight processes that are actually handling requests. Each of those is actually going to have a, a single inst uh, circuit breaker instance per process. So they're all going to be incrementing together. And so essentially what Netflix does with their monitoring solution there is it's actually just an aggregate. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you're, uh, so each of those processes as they're handling requests will essentially increment, 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 and then assuming that the downstream service is really down, they're all going to basically eventually hit the, uh, um, the, uh, they're going to go into a open state and start prevent uh, requests. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hey, thanks. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, the, you actually had a really interesting slide, a slide about the Hysterix UI. Um, is, have you seen anything for Python uh, to kind of have some of that? So uh, w one of my goals before coming here was to try to hack that to work with Python, and cool. you know, time and life uh, caught up to me. Uh, I am thinking about it potentially as a sprint, uh, uh, a sprint uh, idea. But um, if you're interested in that, talk to me after the talk. Cool. But yeah, I, I don't know anything that works out of the box with PyBreaker just yet. Um, PyBreaker has some pretty cool stuff for just like simply logging. Um, so uh, you know, as all this stuff is happening, you can simply just you know dump stuff to logs, and then you could you know build your own uh, graphs you know in Splunk or something like that with that uh, log data. Uh, but nothing as full featured as Hystrix yet. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Okay. And last question. You mentioned that only at the business logic level can you really know whether it's safe to retry or whether you can degrade in a, in a reasonable way. Uh, but then you can, often, you can end up in a situation where every endpoint or every service has its own sort of special snowflake retry behavior. Sure. So how do you keep that from multiplying in complexity? Yeah, that's, um, that's tough. I mean, really, you, you want to think about things of, you know, I like to divide things up into is it critical or is it non-critical? And so in that example back there, I, you know, determined that this time service is not critical, and so thus I'm going to kind of give it the gamut of, you know, a circuit breaker and a timeout. But in the case of the user service, 
you know, I said, oh, I really want this information to show up to the user no matter what. So I'm going to do my best effort. And so that's when, you know, I would want to employ a retry simply because it's worth it in my mind to make that, you know, put that extra load on that service just to kind of get that information to a user. So, you know, making that decision can be, I guess, difficult. Uh, and, you know, like, like you pointed out, you know, obviously there's only two pieces of information there. But what do you do when you have a page that has hundreds of pieces of information on it? Divide and conquer, you know, uh, you know, start breaking stuff into sections and saying, you know what, this whole section can fail, I don't care about it at all, uh, or if this section is totally critical, it needs to succeed no matter what. Um, so yeah, uh, that way, <laughs> there's, there's really no, I guess, right answer there. It's really just, I guess, whatever makes the most sense for your business, you know? So. Great, that would be it. Cool. Thank you, Daniel, for a great talk. Cool, thank you.